Pfizer's vaccine application for kids under the age of five. And then I'll cover operational planning so that we're ready for that age group. With that, over to Dr. Walensky. Dr. Walensky. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon. I'd like to start by walking you through today's data. The current seven-day daily average of cases is about 446,400 cases per day, a decrease of about 36% over the previous week. The seven-day average of hospital admissions is about 17,100 per day, also a decrease of about 14% over the previous week. And the seven-day average daily deaths are about 2,300 per day, which is an increase of about 4% over the prior week. While we continue to see large decreases in average daily case counts across the country, hospitalizations remain high, stretching our healthcare capacity and workforce to its limits in some areas of the country. And daily deaths also remain quite high. And with the mixed news above, similar to other waves during the pandemic, our data continue to reinforce the critical importance of vaccination. Last week, I shared data from our surveillance studies demonstrating the effectiveness of va vaccination, including boosters, on decreasing cases, emergency department visits, and hospitalizations. Additional new data continue to support these findings. On this slide, you can see data from 25 U.S. jurisdictions that report cases and deaths linked to vaccination status. Similar to what I showed you last week, vaccination and booster doses substantially decrease the risk of death from COVID-19. Looking at the data from the week ending December 4th, the number of average weekly deaths for those who were unvaccinated was 9.7 per 100,000 people, but only 0.7 per 100,000 people for those who were vaccinated. This means the risk of dying from COVID-19 was 14 times higher for people who were unvaccinated compared to those who received only a primary series. For those who were boosted, the average of weekly deaths was 0.1 per 100,000 people, meaning that unvaccinated individuals were 97 times more likely to die compared to those who were boosted. I also want to share new data from CDC's COVIDnet hospital surveillance network to further show how essential vaccination and boosting is in preventing hospitalization from COVID-19. On this slide, you can see data comparing the percentage of people age 65 and older who are unvaccinated and boosted in the general population in blue and those who are hospitalized in green. As shown on the slide, only 12% of those age 65 and over remain unvaccinated in the general population. But when we look at those over the age of 65 who are in the hospital for COVID-19, 54% are unvaccinated. In stark contrast, now let's look at those who have been boosted on the bottom. Here, 57% of those over age 65 are boosted in the general population and only 8% of those over the age of 65 and in the hospital for COVID-19 have received a booster dose. These same trends are seen across all age groups. These data show us that the percent of people who are currently hospitalized due to COVID-19 are disproportionately unvaccinated and disproportionately not boosted. Additionally, these data confirm that vaccination and boosting continue to protect against severe illness and hospitalization even during the Omicron surge. If you are not up to date on your COVID-19 vaccinations, you have not optimized your protection against severe disease and death, and you should get vaccinated and boosted if you are eligible. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Dr. Walensky. What I'd like to do over the next couple of minutes is to address a common misperception and the result of misinformation. And that is whether vaccination negatively impacts people trying to conceive, namely, does it have a negative impact on fertility? The data are clear. Next slide. I will show a couple of representative studies. This published just a week and a half ago in the American Journal of Epidemiology, which is a prospective cohort study of vaccination and SARS infection and fertility. 
The study is an NIH funded pregnancy study online or presto for short of couples who are trying to conceive through intercourse. It enrolled participants before pregnancy and collected data on vaccination and other variables during the preconception period, and then collected data on subsequent fertility. There were over 2000 females between the ages of 21 and 45 in the US or Canada. They were enrolled between December 2020 and September 2021, and they were followed through November 2021. Next slide. The data are clear. COVID-19 vaccination in male or female partners did not affect the likelihood of conception. Couples were 18% less likely to conceive if the male partner had been infected with SARS-CoV-2 within 60 days before a menstrual cycle. That is infected, not vaccinated. However, COVID-19 disease only temporarily reduced male fertility. Next slide. In another study published again about a week and a half ago, this was in an in vitro fertilization clinic. And the question that was asked that were people vaccinated in this case, either with the Pfizer or the Moderna product had similar responses to ovarian stimulation, which is used to stimulate the ovary in preparation for in vitro fertilization and similar pregnancy outcomes compared with unvaccinated people. The reproductive potential does not appear to be affected by vaccination in people who undergo in vitro fertilization. Next slide. So what's our takeaway message about vaccination and conception? New data add to previous studies that indicate that COVID-19 vaccination does not negatively impact fertility. CDC and professional medical organizations serving people of reproductive aid emphasize, as shown on this website, that there's no evidence that vaccination impairs fertility. And of course, as we've all said over and over again, vaccination is recommended for people who are trying to get pregnant now or might become pregnant in the future, as well as their partners. And anyone who's vaccinated and pregnant, breastfeeding, trying to get pregnant now, or might become pregnant in the future, should also get a booster shot when eligible. Final slide, the message is the same. Get vaccinated and get boosted for so many reasons. Now over to you, Dr. Murthy. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fauci. And it's good to be with everyone again today. As many of you know, the FDA has now received Pfizer's application for a vaccine for children aged six months through four years. Now, Jeff is going to talk more about how we're preparing for the possibility of this milestone. But first, I want to walk you through the process. Pfizer's application will now undergo the same independent, rigorous, and transparent review process that was used to authorize the vaccines that now more than 250 million Americans have received, including millions of children ages five and up. It will involve the FDA receiving the full data from Pfizer, posting that data publicly, and then convening its advisory committee for a transparent discussion of the data. The FDA will then render its opinion, after which the CDC and its advisory group will assess the data and make their recommendation. This is the same rigorous process that was used to assess numerous vaccines long before the pandemic began. I know how eager parents and caregivers are for the good news on this front. For much of this pandemic, millions of parents have carried with them an added layer of worry knowing that their children under five didn't have protection from COVID the way older vaccinated children do. I felt this worry too, as the father of a four-year-old daughter who is not yet eligible to get vaccinated. That's why I'm hopeful that we may be one step closer to having an added layer of protection for our younger children and one less worry for their parents. A vaccine for children under five would mean we would have vaccines available for essentially all age groups in America this would be a major milestone. Now, there are a number of steps ahead to determine if the vaccine is both safe and effective for our kids under five. And please know that the FDA will not cut any corners in their review process. They know that they are the gold standard that all of us rely on. If and when the FDA and CDC decide to move forward, 
we will work closely with our trusted community partners to ensure that families have accurate science-based information about the vaccine so that they can make the best decisions for their children. And as we await this review process, I wanna emphasize once more just how important it is that the rest of us get vaccinated and get our kids five and older who are already eligible vaccinated as well. If you are 12 and up and you're vaccinated, please get boosted as soon as you're eligible. And all of us should wear high quality masks when in public indoor settings. This is how we can continue to create a wall of protection around our children under five as we look to safeguard their health. Thanks so much for your time today. I'll pass it to Jeff. Well, thanks doctors. Um, if the FDA authorizes and CDC recommends this vaccine, 18 million children under the age of five will become eligible for protection from COVID-19. Before we open up for questions, I wanna share how we're preparing now, just as we did with vaccines for kids ages five to 11, so that we are ready and we hit the ground running following decisions from FDA and CDC. Importantly, this vaccine is specifically formulated for kids under the age of five. So we're working closely with states, local health departments, pediatricians, families, doctors, and pharmacies to ensure the vaccine is available at thousands of locations nationwide. We've already secured ample doses and the necessary needles and supplies specially made for kids in this age group. Following FDA authorization, we would immediately begin packing and shipping doses to states and healthcare providers. And in short order, following CDC recommendations, parents will be able to get their kids under five vaccinated at convenient locations, locations they know and trust. While we know many parents are eager to get their kids the protection of the vaccine, we know others have questions. So we're working with our partners to ensure all parents have access to the facts and information they need to make the right decision. And as always, we're laser focused on equity and making sure we reach the hardest hit and most at risk communities and families. A year ago, we stood up a historic nationwide vaccination program that's now gotten 75% adults in the US fully vaccinated. We then launched a boosters program that's gotten almost 90 million Americans their booster shot. And we established a vaccination program specifically for kids ages five to 11 that has protected millions of kids around the country. Now with a potential vaccine for kids under five on the horizon, our message to parents and families is simple. We're doing everything we can to prepare now we're taking all of the best practices and applying all the lessons learned over the last 12 months to ensure getting kids under five, the protection of vaccine is easy and convenient. And we'll be ready to start getting shots in arms soon after FDA and CDC make their decisions. With that, let's open it up for some questions. Kevin. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Please keep your questions to one. Uh, first, let's go to Laura Santhanim at PBS. Thanks so much. Can, um, thinking about uh, long COVID treatment, can you tell me uh, sort of uh, latest updates with uh, with research about uh, treatment availability and, um, and and accreditation of clinics offering that treatment? Dr. Fauci, long COVID treatments. Yeah, there is a very large study that's been initiated some time ago, um, the Recover study. Uh, at the NIH in collaboration with other agencies, looking at the incidence, the prevalence, and hopefully understanding the pathogenic mechanisms of long COVID. Right now, the data are starting to come in. It's too early to make any definitive statements, but for those individuals, and as you know, long COVID means the persistence of signs and symptoms that are not explainable by any ready, readily recognizable pathogenic process following the recovery from the acute infection. There have been subject, some suggestions that it is an aberrant inflammatory response, perhaps some element of autoimmunity, perhaps some element of persistence of nucleotide fragments from the virus. All of these now are being actively pursued, but before we can make any definitive statements, we need to learn a lot more about it with the ultimate goal of figuring out how we might be able to mitigate 
or prevent some of those symptoms. Thank you. Next question, please. Go to Jeff Mason at Reuters. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is about the the data and about habits. Uh, with regard to data, for Dr. Fauci or, or Dr. Walensky, what is your take on why the booster rate seems to be lagging? Why would people who have decided to get vaccinated, first and second doses, not be getting more boosters? And and secondly, with regard to your uh, the the data the data today with cases going down and hospitalizations going down, Dr. Lewinsky, Walensky, do you think people uh, should start to change their habits and it's okay now to maybe gather in groups more to go out to bars and restaurants, or what is the overall guidance right now in terms of uh, in terms of gathering in groups? Jeff, this is Jeff. Why don't we just start with the baseline on where we are in the booster data? Um, and that is that uh, about half of all Americans who are eligible for a booster have gotten a booster. Eligibility is five months or greater for the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, and two months for J&J. &J. And uh, importantly, about 70% of seniors, those over 65, have gotten a booster. As you know, boosters are widely available. They're at convenient locations around the country, and they're free. And obviously, the, the impact of a booster, as Dr. Walensky said, is really important. So we obviously want to continue to drive that number higher and higher, the percent of Americans who have boosters. But over to you, Dr. Fauci, and then over to you, Dr. Walensky. Well, Jeff, you know, I, I'm really not sure. You're asking a good question. It's almost a psychological, sociological question. Why were people who had enough uh, understanding of the risk to go ahead and get the primary series, why we don't have more getting the booster. I don't have an easy explanation for that. That's one of the reasons why we keep trying to put the data out, because as Dr. Walensky showed in her slide, the data are really stunningly obvious why a booster is really very important. You first need to get vaccinated before you get boosted, that's for sure. But when you look at the difference of how booster for everything you ask it to do, to reconstitute from an immunological and from a clinical standpoint, the diminished protection that you get not only with waning naturally of immunity, but also the negative impact on some of the variants that elude the immune response. Fortunately for us, when you boost with the standard vaccine, which is against the original viral sequence that you get such a good response. So the only thing that we can do is to continue to come out with the data and to make sure the American public appreciates why it is so important for optimal protection to get boosted. And maybe I'll just add in there um, with regard to where cases and hospitalizations are. I think we are all cautiously optimistic as we're seeing cases come down week over week, down 36% over the last week. Um, I do think we have to use an important metric as a barometer, which is how are our hospitals doing? And our hospitalization rates are still quite high and certainly um, having hospital capacity challenges in many parts of the country still. So with that barometer, um, we've said before, almost Omicron milder does not mean mild. And so we really do have to look to our hospitalization rates and our death rates to look to when is time to lift some of these mitigation efforts. We will continue to reevaluate and we know people are anxious. Next question, please. Let's go to Jeannie Bauman at Bloomberg. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I was hoping, Jeff, you could be a little bit more, um, when you said short order for the availability of those kids' vaccines, where you mean, I was hoping, do you mean like a week or a few days? And then Dr. Fauci, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the pandemic preparedness um, plan that NIAID released today and you know how the lessons from COVID helped drive some of those plans and, and what type of funding do you need um, to implement it? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, on the... Um vaccines for kids under five. Uh, we're doing all the preparation now uh, that we can do to be ready so that it'll be available at trusted locations uh, as soon as possible. Uh, post, I wanna emphasize again, FDA and CDC recommendations 
uh, we cannot begin actually packing and shipping until the FDA authorization. And then there's the CDC ACIP process, which generally takes place a matter of days after the FDA. Uh, so we're talking, um, you know, a matter of uh, several days to a week or so uh, based on the five to 11 year experience of from FDA authorization uh, to when the first doses will start to be shots in arms, but we'll move as fast as possible pending the decision of CDC and FDA. And I think the preparation we're doing now will enable us to do so. The second part of your question. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that, Jeff. She was asking about the pandemic preparedness plan. You know, very briefly, Jeannie, it is really uh, founded on what we've been talking about for some time now, which is the prototype pathogen approach where you get fundamental information, data, and preparedness on each of the multiple families that are projected to be as a risk. For example, fortunately for us, we had been doing that with the coronaviruses when we got a lot of information from SARS-CoV-1 and MERS and were already involved in the preparation of both platform technology and immunogen design, we plan to do that by selecting out anywhere from 10 to 20 families of viruses in which we could find common denominators within the family and do the immunological background to do the development of phase one type vaccines so that we could hit the, the ground running. The second part of the program relates to both the development and the discovery of antiviral drugs. Those that are already around, namely have been used for other purposes that we might apply them to whatever of the families that I mentioned a moment ago. But the other is to use the replication cycle of the virus is similar to what we did with HIV and what we're doing with COVID-19 to be able to develop antivirals against the whole family. That's just kind of a snapshot of the plan that the NIH just recently put out. With regard to the budget, I mean, obviously it's too early to talk about that because we're in negotiations right now for what our budgetary needs are. Thank you. Next question, please. Let's go to Meg Torrell at CNBC. Thanks. Um, one for Dr. Fauci and one for Dr. Walensky. Um, for Dr. Fauci, are you expecting we'll see an efficacy update with the data for kids under five? I think a lot of parents are just unsure about how optimistic they should be feeling right now um, when the last update we got was that the immunobridging study didn't meet goals. So are you expecting to see that we'll actually see this prevent cases of COVID? Um, and then for Dr. Walensky, can you give us an update on BA2, its prevalence and your expectation for how it could affect sort of the curve of this Omicron wave? Yeah, Meg, thank you. I mean, obviously we are anticipating that we will get a good efficacy signal for the use of vaccines in children under five years old. But right now, as you know, the FDA is looking at the data very carefully and in their typical fashion, they will be very careful in scrutinizing the data and making a recommendation and a decision based on that data. So I don't wanna get ahead of them, but of course we're anticipating we will get a vaccine efficacy signal that would allow for the use of this vaccine in children. But let's wait for the FDA determination and ultimately the CDC recommendation. Dr. Walensky. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Meg, for that question. So um, our genomic surveillance now is detecting BA2, um, projecting around one and a half percent in this country. Of course, that varies for different parts of the country, but around one of one and a half percent projection of the sequences that we're seeing. What we know about BA2 so far is that it does have a modest transmission advantage over BA1. However, it's not nearly the transmission advantage that we've seen between Omicron and Delta. In in terms of early studies, we have not seen any studies that suggest it's more severe, um, nor have we seen studies that suggest that it will evade our vaccines any more so than Omicron has already, and in fact that our vaccines will work just like it has with Omicron. Um, so, so in terms of how we anticipate this will uh, impact cases, in many places we've seen BA2 so far, um, cases have continued to come down, although at a slower rate. In some cases, in some countries like Denmark, um, cases have gone up 
associated with BA2, but that's also in the context of relaxing mitigation strategies, mitigation measures, which is why we're currently keeping those in place, among the reasons. Jeff, can I add uh, Please one point to Meg's question? Meg, at the heart of your question, I think is something that many parents may be wondering about, which is what's changed between December when Pfizer uh, shared their news and, and now? And there is a big change that's happened, which is we experienced the Omicron surge. And with many children in particular, uh, as well as adults being uh, infected and ending up in the hospital during the Omicron surge, it turns out that has actually facilitated the collection of more of important clinical data, additional clinical data that we did not have in December. Uh, whether that changes the risk benefit profile is what the FDA will be assessing. Uh, but there has been developments since December on the data front. Next question, please. Jacqueline Howard at CNN. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I understand that earlier this week, governors who met with the president expressed that they were seeking more clear guidelines from the White House on what the transition out of the pandemic and into a greater state of normality might look like. Um, obviously, I know we're not quite there yet, but my question is, when might we see such guidance? And can you give us any insight into if and how those guidelines will be prepared, what metrics will be considered, and how will that guidance be communicated to state leaders and to the public? Thank you. Well, as, as you can see from the discussion today, right now, our focus is on fighting Omicron. Um, while cases are coming down, as Dr. Walensky pointed out, there's still a high level of hospitalization, largely driven, uh, as the data shows, by the unvaccinated. At the same time, uh, we are always you know, planning for the future. The most important thing that we have uh, now, when comparing to a year ago, um, are the tools to protect people the vaccines and, and the effectiveness that we've talked about, particularly with boosters that offer the highest, highest level of protection, a pediatric vaccine um, on the horizon, and treatments, including pills uh, that are highly effective against severe disease and hospitalization. So we are in a much stronger position than a year ago. Uh, we have 210 million people fully vaccinated, including 75%, three out of four of every adult. Uh, we had less than a percent uh, a, when the president took office a year ago, people vaccinated. So from 1% up to 75% of adults, 98, 99% of schools are open. That number was 46% when the president took office. We have free tests, free masks, and booster shots widely available. So our progress over the last year and the tools we now have certainly allow us to get closer to a time when COVID doesn't disrupt our daily lives, but is something we protect against and treat. And as we make uh, more progress against Omicron, uh, we'll you know, get closer to that point. The next question, please. What is it? And thank you. Um, thanks, I just w I was wanted to follow up on uh, Jeff's last point there. Uh, and may get the doctor's input as well. In terms of that, pathway to that vision of, of a point where COVID-19 doesn't alter American's daily lives, you know, for many of the past couple of years, it feels a little bit like, you know, they're, they're Charlie Brown in football here where it's, you know, get vaccinated and uh, no, but I need to get a booster. But even if you're vaccinated or boosted, you still need to wear your mask to protect people who, who aren't vaccinated. Is there a sense yet that you can offer the American public based upon your studies, based upon what you now know about Omicron? You know, is this the last wave? Is there enough that you can say by a point certain COVID will not impact people's daily lives anymore. And, and if not, you know, why not? What else do you need to know? Dr. Fauci? Well, we have to be totally honest that we don't know. We're, we believe that we are now going in the right direction. And the best case scenario, as I and my colleagues have often described, is that with the tools that we have, the vaccination, the boosting, the testing, the masking and all the other mitigations that we know about, when you have a level of community protection, which is the level of immunity throughout the community, that we will reach a stage, and I hope that it's sooner rather than later, when, as you have said, this will not dominate our lives. In other words, it will be similar to the assimilation 
of this virus in the group of viruses that we have learned to live with without disruption of our society. You know, the RSVs, the parainfluenzas, the influenzas, where it's there, it's present, it hasn't been eradicated, it hasn't been eliminated, but it isn't at a, at a level that it essentially dominates what we do and dramatically influences our lives. We believe we will get there. We can't guarantee that there will not be another variant that challenges us, but the best that we can do with that is to be prepared for it. And that's why we're doing all the things that we're doing with regard to getting better, more um, advanced vaccine, for example, different platforms, different imaging and designs, development and discovery of new drugs, all of that will be part of the armamentarium that will ultimately, even with the appearance of additional variants, will get us to the point where we will not be dominated by this virus, where we can return to a degree of normality that we all crave for. Please. All right, time for a couple more questions. Let's go to Cheryl Stolberg at the New York Times. Thanks for um, taking this question. It's for Jeff and for Dr. Fauci. Um, Senators Murray and Burr have proposed a legislation that would create a task force to examine the initial emergence of the coronavirus and also assess the United States response across both the Trump and Biden administrations. Um, it would be appointed by Congress, not by the White House. And I'm wondering to Jeff, is this something that the president supports? And for Dr. Fauci, do you think it's necessary to conduct an inquiry into the origins of the virus? Well, Cheryl, thanks for the, the question. I'd start with, you know, we share the senator's focus. A lot of the bill um, is about building stronger public health systems. And we appreciate the bipartisan goals to ensure the country's better prepared uh, for outbreaks uh, in the future like COVID. Right now, as we've been talking about, our, our you know, focus is 100% on fighting Omicron and COVID. And while cases are coming down, the hospitalizations, as we discussed, are, are, are still quite high. Um, and across time, uh, we do look forward to engaging with Congress and reviewing lessons learned from this pandemic uh, so I think that uh, right now our focus is on Omicron, uh, but we appreciate the, the work the senators have done and look forward to working with them. Dr. Fauci? Yeah, Cheryl, I think it's important to look at every aspect of this outbreak for lessons learned. That is not only what the origin of the virus and the origin of the outbreak is, but many other things that we could learn from in the future so that we can prevent something like this happening or respond better if and when it does. One of those is understanding what the origin of the virus is. And it's very important. For example, studies were done with the first SARS-CoV-1 that we experienced in 2002 and 2003. And there was a mystery about how that happened. And then finally, after a lot of studies that actually took years to finally show that the origin was from a bat to an intermediate host to a human, very likely, in a wet market type situation. That was very important because that led to things that unfortunately were not followed, namely a better control and regulation of the wild animal trade and the interface between humans and animals. The other one was mares, in which it was shown finally that this was a bat reservoir that very likely infected camels and camels to human. That also provides public health guidelines for the interaction of an animal-human interface. So it would be obviously important to be able to determine how this went from what was very likely an animal reservoir, given the similarity with bat viruses, how that happened to go into humans to lead to this outbreak. Understanding that will help us to prepare for any future outbreak as well as prepare for a response. So I'm definitely in favor of that. Kevin? Last question. Let's go to Peter Sullivan, the Hill. Hi, thanks. Um, there's a group of Democrats in Congress have called for $17 billion in the next 
appropriations package for global vaccinations and other aspects of the global response. I'm, I'm wondering if the White House supports that, and are, are you planning to, you know, ask Congress for that in the next package? Thanks. So we have um, what we need in this current fight against Omicron, uh, and we've done a lot to prepare for what's ahead. We have boosters for all Americans. We've secured 20 million doses of the highly effective Pfizer pill. We've expanded supplies and stockpiles of PPE, including masks and gloves. Uh, so while we have enough money, enough funding uh, for the current immediate needs, we need to continue, as we've talked about, to stay ahead of the virus. And we are looking at a future where we will likely need funding for treatments and pills. We'll need funding to uh, continue to expand testing and to continue to lead the effort uh, as we've done with 1.2 billion doses donated to the world, but to continue to lead that effort to vaccinate the, the world. So we will be working with Congress as needed to make sure we have the funding to continue to fight this virus. I wanna uh, thank everybody for the questions and look forward to the next briefing. Thank you. The threat from the Chinese Communist Party, it is a subterfuge intended to conceal what this legislation is actually about, a repackaged Build Back Better, and the, de the Democrats' backup plan to push their Green New Deal agenda. It's $350 billion in deficit spending to pay off the climate activists and the labor unions that run the Democrat Party. It sends $10 billion of taxpayer funds to a climate slush fund at the UN that subsidizes solar projects in China that use Uyghur slave labor. The bill implements a supply chain resiliency program that gives preferential treatment to labor unions, a scheme designed more to maintain resiliency for Democratic Party fundraising than resiliency of our supply chains. The bill references coral reefs more times than China and climate change twice as much as national security. The bill bans overfishing and the sale of shark fins from the Pacific, but it doesn't put more Virginia-class subs in the Pacific. It doesn't put more Ford-class aircraft carriers in the Pacific. It does nothing to hold the CCP accountable for the origins of COVID at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. By trying to copy China's big government central planning industrial policy, the bill would actually make the United States less, not more competitive. We cannot outcompete China by trying to become more like China. 
But most troubling of all, and what underscores that this bill is not a serious effort to confront the very real economic and security challenges posed by the People's Republic of China, is the fact that this bill completely disregards the work of the China Task Force, as well as the work of this, the bipartisan U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. If this bill were serious, it would take into account these recommendations. It does neither of those things. This was a very serious effort that this bill completely disregards. Exhibit A of how unserious the bill is when it comes to confronting China, it does nothing to confront the unfettered access of Chinese... Thank you. 30 seconds. Exhibit A is recognized for an additional one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank, thank the gentleman. Exhibit A of how unserious this bill is when it comes to confronting China is how it does nothing to address the key challenge facing us from China, and that is the unfettered access that the Chinese Communist Party, military, and surveillance companies now have to American capital markets. If we really wanted to confront the threat from China, we would protect American investors from unwittingly financing and fueling the rise of China. This bill does nothing to address that. Right now, American investors are unwittingly fueling the civil military fusion of the Chinese Communist Party. The House should pass a real bill, a bill recommended by this report, the Chinese Military and Surveillance Company Sanctions Act, that would actually address Chinese access to American capital markets. Today, Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to re reject this subterfuge, reject this distraction, this bill that they say confronts China but does nothing of the sort that actually assists and enables the rise of China. Let's formulate a real strategy that will position us to take on the military, economic, and technological threat of the Chinese Communist Party, and I yield back. The gentleman from Florida Reserves, the gentlelady from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield one minute to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Tu. The gentlelady from California is recognized for one minute. I rise today in strong support of the America Competes Act, which will make historic investments in America and ensure we, we remain a global leader in science and technology. From climate change to cybersecurity, many of the greatest challenges facing our country can only be met through research and innovation that will develop new products and create new jobs. But in order to rise to this moment, we need to turbocharge America's scientific sector. And that is what this bill would do by investing $52 billion for semiconductor production here at home, an investment that will improve the supply chain for almost every product in our lives. And it modernizes the National Science Foundation to advance America's scientific leadership by supporting institutions like Caltech based in my district, which is one of NSF's most trusted partners. I wanna thank my colleagues today who have modeled responsibility in debating this bill by focusing on what we gain and not who we should fear. Thank you and I yield back. The gentlelady from Texas reserves, the gentleman from Florida is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield one minute to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. LaHood. Two minutes. The two gentleman minutes, from Illinois is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the gentleman for yielding the time. I rise today in opposition of the so-called Competes Act. Instead of following the productive bipartisan efforts initiated in the Senate, House Democrats have chosen the go-at-it-alone approach that fails to meet the urgent needs to strengthen U.S. competitiveness and protect our national security as it relates to China. On the Ways and Means Committee, I've worked across the aisle on China policy with my Democrat colleagues, including trade priorities to bring manufacturing back to the United States, to hold China to their trade commitments, and to prioritize digital trade agreements with like-minded allies to combat China's abusive digital standards. Yet here we are today. Democrats are pushing partisan legislation stocked with more DC control over our economy that fails to address the critical trade initiatives to put American workers and businesses first and to counter the market distorting and dangerous economic practices of China. As a member of the Intelligence Committee and the China Task Force and the co-chair of the bipartisan US-China Working Group, I understand the unique and urgent action required to strengthen American competitiveness and combat growing challenges from China. It's disappointing that House Democrats are again ignoring this opportunity 
to work together with Republicans as they did in the Senate, Republicans and Democrats together to put forth a common sense bill. Where is that bill? It's not here. We need to address the real challenges presented by China. And instead, we are cynically pushing forward unrelated liberal agenda items. Vote no. I yield back. The gentleman from Florida reserves, the gentlelady from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to the gentlelady from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici. The gentlelady from Oregon is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in strong support of the America Competes Act. Our country is home to some of the most cutting edge research, innovative discoveries, and unparalleled national laboratories in the world. Unfortunately, in some ways, we've fallen behind competitors during the past several decades. But with this legislation, we will strengthen our scientific enterprise, bolster research and development, grow our domestic semiconductor manufacturing base, and make sure critical supply chains are based in the U.S. This legislation includes a provision similar to my Regional Clean Energy Innovation Act to help cutting edge technologies achieve commercialization by leveraging regional clean energy capabilities and markets. As co-chair of the House Apprenticeship Caucus, I'm thrilled that Competes includes not only the National Apprenticeship Act, but also my Partners Act, which will promote workforce training and help more people access good paying jobs. I'm very grateful to Chair Johnson for her leadership on this bill and to Chair McGovern for making in order six of my amendments. If incorporated, they will help address climate change, improve workforce development, and enhance STEM education. In particular, the Blue Carbon for Our Planet Act, Blue Globe Act, and Coast Research Act will strengthen coastal acidification research and monitoring, expand efforts to map and conserve blue carbon ecosystems, and enhance ocean data collection. And my Bipartisan Builds Act, which provides grants for infrastructure industry partnerships, will play a pivotal role in helping workers get the skills they need to fill the jobs created by the bipartisan infrastructure law. And my amendment with Mr. Langevin to enhance NF's, NSF's mathematics and science education partnership program will support innovative research and provide professional development uh, by, for educators on how to boost creativity in STEM by integrating the arts. The Competes Act will reinvigorate America's research enterprise and restore its competitive edge. I strongly urge my colleagues to support this important bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I thank Chairwoman Johnson and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady from Texas reserves, the gentleman from Florida is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Chabot. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. As ranking member of the Asia Pacific Subcommittee, which has jurisdiction over China, I rise today in strong opposition to the America Competes Act, which should really be called the America Concedes Act. After decades of inaction, it's high time we reevaluate our basic approach towards engagement with China. On every front, the Chinese Communist Party is aggressively challenging the free world and the premise that open societies and free markets and the rule of law logically result in a prosperous and equitable civilization. The CCP's ambitions have thrust us into a new Cold War that we did not start and we do not want, but which we must win. Because if we fail, the Chinese Communist Party will replace the post-World War II order with one that revolves around Beijing. This moment calls for bold policies to ensure that we win this struggle. On this score, today's legislation is woefully deficient. It's stuffed full of irrelevant provisions. The Foreign Affairs Committee section of the bill is a prime example. It fails to take advantage of serious tools like export controls and security assistance, and instead spends twice as much money on climate policy as it does on China-related matters. Democratic leadership has refused to even allow debate on ranking member McCall's serious amendment or on a package that I offered that includes 13 tough, relevant proposals crafted by subcommittee Republicans. We must take the Chinese Communist Party's threat seriously. If we don't, we're gonna see China continuing to eat our lunch and steal our jobs. This democratic effort was an opportunity for bipartisanship and actually doing something that mattered. 
they blew it. Let's face it. And that's most unfortunately. And therefore, I have to encourage my colleagues to oppose their misguided legislation today. I yield back. The gentleman from Florida reserves, the gentlelady from Texas is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield one minute to the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Lawrence. The gentlelady from Michigan is recognized for one minute. I rise today in strong support of the Completes Act. I'm proud to represent the big three automotive states and a district where GM is headquartered. I know how important it is to fix our supply chain. Semi semiconductors power our economy. Everything from smartphones to computers to cars. We have to start making them here in America. This legislation will make sure that while increasing American innovation, manufacturing, and R&D. And I'm proud to offer two amendments to ensure that our efforts in the Completes Act is centered around equality so that all Americans will benefit from the significant R&D investment of our critical goods while creating good jobs. Let's get this done so we can ensure that our economy is secure and strengthen our global competitiveness. I yield back. The gentlelady from Texas reserves, the gentleman from Florida is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Arkansas, the Republican leader of the National Resources Committee, Mr. Westerman. The gentleman from Arkansas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, I think about when my four children were young, their stair step, two years apart, they used to have competitions in the backyard. They would race from the patio to the elm tree and back. And I would stagger the starting time, let the youngest one go first, then the next to the youngest, and so on. And by the time they touched the tree and came back, it turned into a real competition, uh, a photo finish a lot of times. We've all competed in games whose outcome has little significance in life. But Mr. Speaker, we're not facing an insignificant competition, competition in our future. We are in a race of ideologies. The stakes are as high as they can be. We are literally in a struggle for the future of Western civilization, of democracy, of representative government, of human rights and freedom. Mr. Speaker, this isn't a matter of competing. It's a must-win scenario. And quite frankly, I'm aghast that this majority thinks that we only need to compete. Losing is not an option. Our attitude must be to win. If we lose, humanity loses. I believe freedom-loving Republicans, Democrats, independents, and people all across the world want America to win. I'm disappointed that the speaker and this majority have once again dropped a massive bill that could and should be bipartisan, but instead is a cloak for failed Build Back Better policies that lie dead in the Senate. Mr. Speaker, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We will preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we will sentence them to take the first step into a thousand years of darkness. If we fail, at least let our children and our children's children say of us, we justified our brief moment here. We did all that could be done. Those familiar words were from Ronald Reagan in the 1960s, but they've never been more true than today. How serious are the issues that we face? Take a look at these charts from The Economist. This first one is in 2000. The blue is the U.S. and its trading partners. The red is China and its trading partners. Look what's happened in a short 20-year span as we look at this same map from 2022. We see massive increase in red on this map and a massive decrease of blue on this map. What do provisions in this bill from the Blue New Deal have to do with us winning against China? It does the exact opposite by killing American jobs. Restoring coral reefs off our coast is a commendable goal, but what does spending $292 million on coral reef restoration have to do with us winning against China? This bill gives supreme unilateral authority to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to determine what species can be imported into the U.S. This so-called white list mandated in the bill is virtually impossible to implement and will effectively shut down aquaculture and similar industries who need trade to conduct business. The weaponization of the Lacey Act will only empower bureaucrats and ignores the current state-based approach on species imports. It's legislative laziness since there have been no hearings or even an introduced bill on this topic. 
What in the world does that have to do with winning against China? The bill requires biased studies and new heavy-handed regulations designed to kill American mineral development. Mr. Speaker, how can this majority propose this bill while the De Democratic administration continues to illustrate incompetency by killing American energy and jobs and even pulling mining leases in Minnesota that could create jobs and supply resources for the very policies on electrification the administration supports? This only shifts wealth and jobs to China. How does that help us win? It reminds me of my kids' races, where the majority is trying to handicap America and give China a head start. What we should be, to do, should be doing to have a winning strategy, we should be working together on, this, on real issues to assure that America wins. We should be strengthening diplomacy and trade with our allies and create a solid Western Hemisphere alliance to ensure that America wins. We should be developing our resources and jobs to help America win. We should be part of the solution and not the problem. Americans and freedom will win if we let them. As I close, I want to remind you of a fable by Aesop, the eagle and the arrow. The eagle was struck by an arrow and as he lay on the ground, he looked back at it and he said, alas, I have been wounded by an arrow that was uh, feathered with my own plume. Mr. Speaker, we cannot afford to put more plumes on China's arrows. I oppose this bill and I yield back. The gentleman from Florida reserves, the gentlelady from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield three minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Neal. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for three minutes. I thank you, gentlemen. strong support of the America Competes Act. This legislation will transport our nation to the future. It will strengthen supply chain, advance manufacturing, and create millions of jobs. Ways and Means members assertively made their contributions to this package, including a strong provision for trade adjustment assistance. And to the previous speaker, I know he was sincere in what he said, there will be a final package. It'll be bicameral in nature, bipartisan in nature. It's just too important to get done. The rhythms of legislative life will dictate that outcome. This is a full effort of the House. And to say that there are no provisions in here that Republicans don't favor is simply untrue. The Trade Subcommittee Chairman, Earl Blumenauer, has been a very important leader in developing this legislation. And along with our colleague, Tim Ryan, who has not stopped telling me of just how important this is to Ohio to fund the nation's newest semiconductor factory. This is a good, bold proposal, and I am going to remain standing, Madam Speaker, so that I might yield the balance of my time to the Trade Subcommittee Chair, Mr. Blumenauer. A careful examination of this bill shows many bipartisan proposals. One area of bipartisan agreement is that for too long, America has been too weak in its engagement with China. The Chinese government is strengthening its economic power while doubling down on religious persecution and forced labor. Those practices undercut the competitiveness of American workers and business. Congress must step up, step up and confront China head on. Our trade title does just that. Those damaged by trade, whether workers, business, or farmers, will benefit from a dramatically improved trade adjustment assistance program, which expired in June and completely phases out in July. Our provisions modernizing and reauthorizing GSP and MTB will improve American competitiveness and labor standards around the globe. And we get tough on China by closing the de minimis loophole that allows $800 per day per person uh, to uh, for products undoubtedly including forced labor, intellectual property theft, and illegal goods. China doesn't give us reciprocity on de minimis. Their threshold is less than $8. They're not about to subject their companies to duty-free, unregulated American competition. Allowing items like air conditioners, microwaves, and suitcases under MTB doesn't help American manufacturing. It undercuts it and directly undermines Congress's goal of rebuilding domestic capacity. Our changes restore the programs back to their original attempt, supporting American workers and domestic manufacturing, not undercutting American suppliers. At its simplest, this legislation meets workers' needs and bolsters Americans' capacity to compete. If you want to support the American worker and get tough on China, you have a chance to do so with this bill. I urge everyone to vote in the affirmative. Thank you. Gentlewoman of Florida, 
reserves, the gentleman from Florida is recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield one minute to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Mauser. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank my good friend, colleague, um, the gentleman from Florida. Madam Speaker, we have far too many domestic and international crises facing us right now to name them here. From the southern border to Ukraine, to Afghanistan, to the crime in Philadelphia streets, to soaring gasoline prices, supply chain bottlenecks. We have an opportunity here to make the U.S. economy more competitive. We can do that with the right bill, particularly against our number one competitor and often adversary, China. Rather than lower the costs for American and large, large and small businesses, Madam Speaker, and creating a more competitive business environment, this so-called America Competes Act places burdens on the American economy in the form of debt and regulations is filled with special interest subsidies, nobody can deny that, and has a whopping $325 billion price tag to go along with our, our escalating deficit and debt. Meanwhile, the only part of the $325 billion that I agree with, and I believe my constituents agree with, would be the CHIPS USA Act and some of the- Gentleman's time is expired. Broadband. Can I yield 30 wow. seconds? Yield 30 seconds, Thank Madam you. Speaker. Uh, this bill really is a plethora of new government programs which will uh, not advance the U.S. economy. Madam Speaker, this bill will likely get the vote of China, but would not get the vote of American small business. The CCP is very serious about economic growth with little regard for how to get there. We had better wake up or we will be responsible for letting them. I yield back. Thank you. Gentlewoman of Texas is recognized. Madam Speaker, how much time do we have remaining? 33 minutes. Thank you very much. I yield one minute to the general lady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Wild. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am pr proud to rise in support of the Competes Act. This legislation incorporates two bills that my office introduced, the Supply Chain Security and Resilience Act and the Regional Innovation Act. At a time when the need to finally secure our supply chains and rebuild a made in America economy could not be clearer, my provisions of the bill from the Supply Chain Security and Resilience Act will put us on the path to doing just that. By creating a new office within the Commerce Department to promote U.S. leadership of critical industries and supply chains that are essential to our national and economic security, we will join businesses and government in common national effort. The Regional Innovation Act would establish a regional technology and innovation hub program at the Department of Commerce to support regional economic development and innovation hubs nationwide. We can ensure that workers and businesses from all corners of our country, not just the coasts, benefit from investment. My community, Pennsylvania's greater Lehigh Valley, is full of workers and businesses who have the vision the talent and the grit to reach global economic heights. They deserve the exposure to get their products to market. Our country has extraordinary promise. Gentlewoman's Let's pass time has expired. Bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back. Gentleman from Texas is, or from Florida is recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield one minute to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Murphy. Gentleman's recognized. Madam Speaker, this so-called competition bill proves just how feckless Democrats are about confronting our biggest adversary the Chinese Communist Party. Why is this president so afraid to call out China? They are our greatest generational threat to democracy, human rights, and the American way of life. China will stop at nothing until they have world domination. The confronting communist China should be a clear bipartisan priority. As Secretary Pompeo recently said, the Chinese have infiltrated our schools, businesses, and politics, and will stop at nothing until they have world domination. We should be coming together on, our strong, on a strong consensus framework that holds China accountable and strengthens our national security. Instead, Speaker Pelosi offers more poison pills that will be dead on the arrival in the Senate. Let us stop the nonsensical leftist progressive messaging and be serious about our jobs. Democrats have steamrolled Congress with yet another multi-billion dollar package, thousands of pages long, without proper analysis. Our nation now hits a $30 trillion debt mark this week. I refuse to support another package that sends hard-earned taxpayer dollars to the Chinese Communist Party. 
Please, I urge my colleagues to vote no on the America Concedes to, America Concedes to China Act. Gentlewoman uh, from Texas is recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield one minute to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kilday. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in support of the America, uh, America Competes Act. With this legislation, we have an opportunity to strengthen domestic supply chains, to invest in American manufacturing, and to lower costs for families, for small businesses, for seniors. This pandemic has exposed deep weaknesses in our supply chains that have increasingly relied on foreign manufacturing instead of making goods right here in America with American workers. This bill will help fix our broken supply chains so that we can build more critical components here in America, not overseas in China where the government exploits its own people. For Michigan auto workers, this includes addressing the semiconductor chip shortage, which has shuttered auto plants and forced thousands of auto workers to temporarily be laid off. This bill will invest billions to bring chip manufacturing back to the United States. And also this legislation includes my legislation to create a new trade adjustment assistance for communities program that will help many older industrial communities that have been negatively impacted by trade communities like Flint and Saginaw Bay City. TAA for communities will address the needs in Gentleman's these places time and develop expired. local economic development strategies. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation. Yield back. Gentleman from Florida is recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield one, mi one minute to the gentlewoman from Georgia, Ms. Green. Gentlewoman's recognized. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition to another bill that puts China first and America last. Instead of focusing on a bill that's almost 3,000 pages worth 325 estimated billion in spending estimated that doesn't really help America. It's going to give out $8 billion to the UN Climate Fund and mentions coral reefs 383 times. What Congress should be doing is working on a budget that will fund our government since we're running out of money in just a few weeks. What Congress should be doing is doing something about the fentanyl that's coming from China that's killing young people and is now the number one cause of death in Americans from 18 to 45, not COVID-19. What Congress should be doing is, is funding a wall, building a wall, protecting our border, and deporting illegal aliens who are stealing American jobs. That's what we should be doing to help the American worker. But instead, we're debating a bill that's going to fund climate change, the Green New Deal, and help the coral reefs. This isn't what Americans care about. We all should be voting no and doing a better job. Gentlewoman of Texas is recognized. Madam Speaker, I request one minute of the gentlelady lady from New Mexico, Ms. Fernandez. The gentlewoman is recognized. Madam Speaker, with the America Competes Act, we will invent it in America, we will build it in America, and we will create American jobs. Importantly, Competes gives us the opportunity to discover, develop, and make what we need everywhere in America. That's why I introduced and urged my colleagues to support four amendments that could expand jobs to rural, Latin, Latino, Native American, and minority communities. The workers that produce what America needs must look like America. The Competes Act could invest billions of dollars to build chips and conduct research in New Mexico and other communities facing economic despair. With my amendments, this bill can create jobs for that beautifully diverse workforce that powered our nation as we transition to clean energy. Energy workers deserve economic opportunity in a changing world. Let's ensure we have the innovation training and jobs for American workers everywhere as we power a prosperous future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back. Gentleman of Florida is recognized. Uh, where we are, sir, excuse me. There we are, Madam Speaker. I yield one, one minute to the gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Hartzler. The gentlewoman's recognized. Thank you. I rise in opposition to the so-called America Competes Act. Let's be, let's be clear. China is one of the largest national security threats our nation faces. Addressing this threat will require a whole of nation approach with policies to enable the United States to not only compete, but beat China. 
This legislation fails to achieve that goal. Unfortunately, the Democrats have once again rushed through a massive package riddled with partisan and unvetted policies that enriches China rather than constraining them. Amazingly, the Democrats block consideration of all my common sense amendments, which would have prevented known Chinese spies from entering our nation, stop CCP officials from taking advantage of our higher education system and sanction those responsible for forced abortions and forced sterilizations of Uyghur women. If Democrats were serious about protecting America, they should have welcomed these common sense measures. This legislation fails to address the threat of China. I urge my colleagues to oppose this legislation and instead work on legislation that will actually empower the United States to beat China. I yield back. The gentlewoman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield one minute to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Price. Gentleman is recognized. Madam Chair, I rise in strong support of the American Competes Act, in particular the inclusion of legislation to reauthorize Title VI of the Higher Education Act, sponsored by myself and Representative Young of Alaska. This will uh, help our nation develop a strong foundation in international education, research, and world language studies, especially in languages that hold special strategic interests. The bipartisan, bicameral bill will increase and expand these programs, incorporating some 200 languages, and also build international capacity at minority-serving institutions. In addition, the America Competes Act enhances the advanced technological education program that the National Science Foundation, uh, doubling the authorization for a program that I helped initiate, which strengthens high-tech worker training through community and technical colleges. It incentivizes critical partnerships between um, businesses and schools to meet local uh, workforce needs. Uh, Madam Chair, I urge adoption of the America Competes Act to better equip our citizens to succeed in an inter increasingly interconnected world. Thank you. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield one minute to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington. I think the gentleman from Florida, uh, Madam Speaker, unfortunately and sadly enough, this is a, a repeat of, of the political ruse where you wrap a flag and give a great name to legislation. The reality is, has very little to do with the threats that China poses to the United States and the world. There's plenty of common ground we could find to work on that uh, big challenge, a huge threat. But instead, uh, this is a misleading piece of legislation. It is another legislative wagon loaded with the same tired old progressive policies, union giveaways, uh, green energy uh, subsidies, and unhinged, in my opinion, social uh, policies and experimentation like training our armed forces not to to fight and win wars, but to combat climate change and naming a chief diversity officer. That should make us safer, uh, all sleep better at night with respect to China. Listen, the, the Democrat Party, Madam Chair, has been hijacked by the left, uh, and they're willing to sacrifice America's prosperity, our security, and our global leadership on climate apocalypse now. I, I don't get it. Thank you for the time, and I yield back. The gentlewoman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield one minute to the gentle lady from Alabama, Ms. Sewell. The gentlewoman's recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise today in support, strong support of the America Competes Act. I'm especially proud that my legislation, H.R. 6121, the Leveling the Playing Field Act 2.0, was included in this bill. This bipartisan legislation sponsored by myself and my Republican colleague, uh, Bill Johnson, will, moder mo will modernize our outdated trade remedy laws to push back against many of China's most aggressive uh, anti-free market practices. For years, a number of American industries have faced repeated dumping and subsidized imports to the U.S. market. In 2000, China produced about 18% of the world's steel. Today, it produces roughly 50%. This overcapacity has undermined U.S. steel manufacturing and has put our steel workers and steel manufacturers like those in my district, U.S. Steel and Nucor, at a big disadvantage. At the end of the day, this bill will promote global competitiveness. And when America competes fairly, America workers win and America businesses win. Thank you, I yield back. 
Gentleman from Florida is recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield one minute to the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Tiffany. The gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Lots of rhetoric today about creating American jobs and having American businesses thrive. Let's read something that was slipped into this bill, a prohibition no person may possess, acquire, receive, transport, offer for sale, sell, or purchase any American mink. What a sneak attack on people that create jobs and create goods for America. These people are good stewards, good stewards of the land, and they are also terrific at animal husbandry. And this is a sneak attack on them trying to drive them out of business. When, there's one question here, when is the hostility to the producers of America, the people that grow our food, clothe our people, and produce our energy going to end by the other side of the aisle? I yield back. The gentlewoman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield one minute to the gentleman from Michigan, gentle lady from Michigan, Ms. Dingell. The gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Madam Chairman. I rise today in strong support of H.R. 4521, the America Competes Act. We stand at a defining moment for the future of American manufacturing and our global competitiveness. If we fail to act, we put both our economic security and our national security at risk. This bold, comprehensive package, which includes several of my bipartisan bills, will create good-paying American jobs through investments to boost American manufacturing, bring our supply chain home, and keep America at the forefront of innovation and technology. The bill includes $52 billion in funding, including $2 billion for legacy automotive chips, to address the semiconductor chip shortages, which have crippled the auto industry, shut down plants in my district, and invests in domestic production of critical medicines and PPE, and meaningfully addresses rising prices for everyday goods. And in Michigan and across the nation, too many Americans have been impacted and are counting on us fixing this. By passing the America Competes Act, we will solidify our future leadership around the globe and strengthen our workforce here at home. I urge all of my colleagues to support this bill and yield back. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Uh, Madam Speaker, I yield one minute to the gentlewoman from West Virginia, Ms. Miller. The gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you. Madam Speaker, President Biden's trade moratorium undermines U.S. leadership and hands all adversaries a dangerous opportunity to get ahead. China is seizing this moment to advance in the Indo-Pacific. This is why I joined with my colleague Darren LaHood to introduce the U.S. Trade Leadership in the Indo-Pacific and China Act. Our bill will require President Biden to act and report on a trade strategy in the Indo-Pacific and with China. Once again, Democrats didn't allow any bipartisan input in their legislation. There has been zero guidance by President Biden on a trade plan with China. Instead, we continue on a useless wait-and-see approach. The competition between the U.S. and China demands strong leadership. Democrats must wake up to this reality and take decisive action. I urge my colleagues to support our bill and to ensure America's lasting trade leadership. The gentlewoman of Texas is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield three minutes to the gentleman from New York, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Mr. Meeks. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today in strong support of this bill. We find ourselves in a strategic competition with an increasingly assertive People's Republic of China. The PRC is trying to manipulate and alter the economic, political, and security underpinnings of the American-led rules-based international order, an order that has broken decades of peace, prosperity, stability for many. And it has grown in, as it has grown in wealth and power, we've seen the PRC bend international rules and laws to meet its interests bully nations over maritime and border, border disputes, and grow more closed and authoritarian at home. 
Today, the PRC is systemically leveraging its growing military, economic, and technological health heft to complete with us globally. And that's happening whether we like it or not. So we must reckon with this stark new reality by positioning America to win this competition. And H.R. 4521, the American Competes Act, does just that. It powers the engine of the American economy through investments in science, innovation, and technology. And it raises the flag of American diplomacy and leadership to reassure the world that America is indeed back at the table and ready to counter China's efforts to manipulate the international system and strengthen our allies and partnerships. Centering on, centering on diplomacy and bolstering America's global leadership and engagement are the themes of my bill, the Eagle Act, which serves as the foreign affairs division of American competes. The Eagle Act bolsters our diplomacy bilaterally at regional organizations and through groupings like the Quad to ensure that we bring our partners and allies with us to prevent the PRC from undermining global rules. It demonstrates that, the Amer that America is capable and willing to tackle the world's biggest problems and marshal a response to shared challenges like the current pandemic. And it ensures that the United States will lead with its values and stand up for international law and human rights. In many respects, this legislation goes further than the Senate's competition bill in terms of responding to the PRC's human rights abuses. In addition to sanctions related to the genocide at Xinjiang, the Eagle Act contains refugee protections for the Uyghurs and Hong Kongers, and also calls for a special envoy for Xinjiang. I can say with absolute confidence that when it comes to standing up for our values, America competes is bold and principled. And with the that, gentleman's I time has expired. This historic bill and urge my fellow colleagues to do just the same. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. And Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Texas be allowed to control the remaining time. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Madam Speaker, I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentle, uh, gentleman from Utah, Mr. Moore. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in opposition to H.R. 4521. I, I won't let my constituents be fooled by, by an attempt here to recycle priorities from President Biden's failed Build Back Better plan. While this bill plays a role in, in formalizing a necessary discussion, and again, there, you'll, you'll hear from my comments that there is large bipartisan support on what we need to do here um, to, to, to address the effects of a great power competition on the American economy, it, this is a superficial partisan effort that will not properly confront China and will only make inflation work for American families. This pandemic dashed any illusion that the Chinese Communist Party can be, can be a trusted party, a partner for American business, or, will, or they will take any accountability when their recklessness results in devastating supply chain disruptions. Enhancement to domestic manufacturing that support American workers and increase global competitiveness are long overdue, but sadly, it will continue to go unaddressed by this bill because simply these, this, this, this legislation does not require these organizations to re-examine their relationship with the CCP. And it's, it's an in addition, it's, it's, it's another attempt to create a big, large piece of legislation where you can add in a whole bunch of climate change priorities and the American people, and as I talk to my constituents, they want us to address the issue at hand, not just lump a bunch of things in together. And again, that's what we're doing here by making it a China bill. There is an appetite and desire among many of my colleagues to send a clear message to the Communist Party in Beijing. My constituents want a China bill that confronts intellectual property theft, the genocide of religious minorities, CCP influence in civil society, the antagonism of our allies, and a bill that finally holds the CCP accountable for their covering up of COVID-19. Despite the grave threat our nation faces from the CCP, American ascendancy can be maintained only if we remain the preferred partner across the world and the primary destination for innovators and job creators. Congress can and must do better 
Let's get back to work. And I yield back. The gentlewoman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield one minute to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Caston. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today in support of the Competes Act, and I am particularly proud of the House Science legislation in this bill designed to ensure that the Department of the Energy Office of Science, the National Science Foundation, and NIST are well equipped to succeed in the 21st century. It also invests in a STEM workforce for the future to ensure we have the talents to bring all these semiconductor climate manufacturing jobs back home where they belong. And uh, if I could just share a personal story, about 13 years ago, I was building a tree house in my backyard. And as I was starting, this six-year-old neighborhood kid shows up behind me with a cute little hard hat and a tool belt and said, I'm here to help. And uh, my uh, 2009 summer intern, as it were, is now a sophomore at the University of Illinois studying nuclear engineering. His opportunity was made possible in part by investments that were made decades ago in nuclear technology and a test reactor on that University of Illinois campus. That reactor has now hit the end of life. It's been shut down, and there are a few other states that have those kinds of opportunities. That's why I look forward to the consideration of my National Nuclear University Research Infrastructure Reinvestment Act in competes with Congressman Foster, Congressman Gonzalez, and Congressman Meyer. It'll enhance the research capabilities of nuclear science and engineering programs, meet the workforce needs of the U.S. nuclear industry, and accelerate the deployment of advanced nuclear technologies in Illinois and across the country. I hope my colleagues will join me in supporting this bill as we develop new generation advanced nuclear energy at our nation's The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Madam Speaker, I yield two minutes at this time to the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Kamak. Gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you to my colleague from the great state of Texas. I rise in strong opposition to this bill, which would be more appropriately named the America Concedes Act. Heck, we could go so far as to say that this is the American Corruption Act. This bill has nothing to do with countering China or holding them accountable. It's 2,900 pages, 2,900 pages. Have any of my colleagues supporting this bill actually read the bill? I would venture no, I would say no, they probably haven't because if they had, they would know what was in it and they would recognize that it's selling us out to China. I, however, have read this bill. I have spent the last couple days pouring through the language and have found egregious provision after egregious provision. And quite frankly, it's infuriating. Just one example is the fact under section 61008, COVID pandemic measures could be extended until December 31st, 2025. What better way to make Americans dependent on China for critical supplies like PPE than to mandate that we get it from them and make sure that COVID provisions stay in place. Another example is the 8 billion with a B authorization for the Green Climate Fund, which was conceived as a tool for incentivizing developing countries to participate in the Paris Climate Agreement. In practice, this UN fund has done nothing more but distort global energy markets and even encourages corruption. I have an amendment to this bill that would strike the funding, and I urge my colleagues to support that amendment. However, we know that this is more about politics than it is about good policy, so I'm not particularly optimistic. However, I still would encourage my colleagues to support that amendment. Madam Speaker, this bill is misguided. We should stand as Americans and counter China and its rise, support true American innovation. I encourage my colleagues to oppose this bill. It is dangerous and misguided. With that, I yield back. The gentlewoman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield one minute to the gentle lady from Georgia, Mrs. Valdro. The gentlewoman's recognized. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I rise in strong support of the America Competes Act, a bill that would bolster American leadership in critical economic sectors for decades to come. In addition to necessary provisions to spur American production of semiconductors, the America Competes Act would take action to address supply chain disruptions and shortages. My bill, the Supply Chain Act, is included in this package and would ensure the newly created Office of Supply Chain Resiliency and Crisis Response at the Department of Commerce has the tools it needs to map and monitor critical supply chains, as well as prepare for and respond to supply chain shocks and disruptions. I have heard from families and small businesses and manufacturers in Georgia's 7th District of the challenges presented by supply chain disruptions, especially amidst the pandemic. This package of supply chain resiliency measures will help us to identify and mitigate these disruptions moving forward. 
In closing, I would like to commend my colleagues for their hard work in assembling this critical legislation. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support the America Competes Act, and I yield back. Texas is recognized. Madam Speaker, I stand in strong opposition to what should be called the Concedes Act. Once again, we're voting on a bill that was forced through this chamber in a partisan fashion and one that lacks the policies needed to bolster our competitiveness and combat the threats from our foreign adversaries. The hard work and the bipartisan collaboration of the Space Science and Technology Committee has once again been obliterated so that the left can pass partisan policies. Once again, in a sincere and goodwill attempt to work across the aisle on important policy, I introduced an amendment that would have reauthorized NASA's enhanced use leasing program for one year, a timeline supported by both parties. Um, but to no surprise, the Democrats put messaging over good governance and refused to make this non-controversial amendment in order. And just a few weeks ago, we had a bipartisan EUL bill that had already passed this house. It was stolen from us gutted and turned into a federal election takeover bill. Instead of focusing on common sense solutions to our China problems, H.R. Uh, 4521 hurts the American people. It lets China off the hook for failing to contain COVID-19. It fails to ban funding to CCP uh, tied organizations. It fails to punish the CCP for its blatant human rights abuses, and it fails to stop China's theft of America's intellectual property. Today, we had another opportunity to pass important legislation to support American technology and to hold foreign adversaries accountable 